All right, ladies and gentlemen, thanks again for joining us. Uh, my name is Bob Weber. I'm a faculty member here in animal science and industry at Kansas State University. And we're pleased uh, that you joined us today. We've got, uh, I think, a great lineup uh, of speakers uh, on a really timely topic. We've had uh, uh, some kind of deteriorating uh, moisture conditions here in Kansas. And I suspect there's a, a broader, at least based on the uh, drought monitor map, we'll look at in just a second, um, drought conditions developing across the region. And so we wanted to put together uh, some timely resources for our, our producers um, to uh, begin thinking about some mitigation strategies. And so uh, our webinar today is titled Drought Preparedness for the Cow-Calf Producer. And again, brought to you by uh, our K-State Beef Extension uh, team. The um, um, talks today um, are going to be brought to you by members of our uh, beef extension team. Um, and I uh, just want to make sure uh, you're all aware of uh, our team team members here uh, at the uh, state specialist uh, level, and that's uh, Dr. Dale Blasey. Uh, Dale focuses on some stalker management and nutrition work um, and uh, uh, beef production management. Um, Dr. Jamie Lynn Farney, based in uh, Southeast Kansas, um, specialty in uh, uh, nutrition uh, and forage systems. Um, Dr. Sandy Johnson will be one of our, actually the first speaker in today's program, um, uh, based out in uh, uh, Northwest Kansas at Colby, um, uh, reproductive uh, physiology and management. Um, Dr. A.J. Tarpoff, uh, also one of our speakers today, uh, animal health uh, and well-being. Dr. Tarpoff's a veterinarian by training. Um, Dr. Justin Wagner, um, uh, based in Southwest Kansas, um, uh, nutrition beef systems management. And uh, again, I'm Bob Weber here at uh, on campus um, and work in uh, genetics and, and cow-calf management. I'm sure welcome uh, uh, interaction and questions from uh, agents and producers alike. Uh, we're at, uh, at your disposal and uh, appreciate uh, opportunities to lend our expertise uh, to, uh, to problem solving uh, uh, out in the country and we look forward to, to those interactions. Um, just to kind of set the stage a little bit for our speakers today, um, this is uh, the drought monitor uh, map uh, um, pulled from today, um, uh, updated this morning. And uh, as you can see, uh, uh, sort of a growing uh, uh, abnormally dry and moderate drought conditions uh, across uh, uh, more than two thirds of the state now uh, is in some level of um, drought classification, of course, uh, more extreme in the very western portion of our state. Um, but uh, to a, a point now where we're in, uh, in the growing season, particularly for uh, some of our warm season species that um, more moisture now and doesn't necessarily improve um, grazing capability. And so one of the other tools that uh, our team monitors uh, fairly closely is a product called GrassCast, and we'll have links for this uh, uh, later on. Um, but it gives some forecasts based on uh, some plant growth models for, um, here we see mostly the, the western two-thirds part of Kansas and, and sort of the high plains. Um, and uh, the plot there on the left is uh, what we anticipate in terms of forage production um, for uh, uh, sort of the next uh, June 30th to August 31, so a 60-day period um, uh, with normal precipitation. And so we see, you know, a fair bit of that country um, is going to be below average for uh, plant growth and, and pasture condition then. Um, if we continue to see below average or uh, below normal precipitation, um, uh, that impact uh, expands pretty substantially. So um, we want to uh, start thinking about things we can do to better manage both our, our cow-calf production system, um, but also uh, manage our range resources better. So with that, um, we'll have uh, three speakers today um, in our drought preparedness uh, webinar. Uh, the first one's going to be uh, Dr. Sandy Johnson, um, professor again at Northwest uh, Regional uh, Research and Extension Center in Colby, and she's going to talk uh, about strategic reduction uh, of grazing pressure. Um, followed by uh, Dr. Justin Wagner at, from Southwest, uh, supplementation and early weaned calf nutrition. Um, so how do we uh, manage uh, those uh, early weaned calves as a strategy? Um, and then uh, lastly here, uh, Dr. A.J. Tarpoff um, will talk about uh, some calf health considerations um, as we think about an early weaning option uh, to help manage uh, forage condition in 
cow body condition. So with that, um, we'll start uh, our first speaker is going to be uh, Dr. Sandy Johnson. And I'll give Sandy remote control here. And Sandy, you should be uh, good to go. All right. Well, good afternoon. Glad to, to join with you this afternoon. And what I want to visit with is how we can adjust to the current situation. And there we go. Um, you know, it's pretty clear that we're going to need to reduce uh, grazing pressure in some, some method, whether it's fewer animals for fewer days, uh, reducing the requirements, or some combination of above. And, you know, this always makes challenging decisions because we're trying to balance uh, long term rain, range condition with some shorter term issues that have to do with cash flow and, and other expenses. So, this is certainly challenging, but it's clear that. In many parts of the state this year, changes are going to be required. So how, how can we go about doing that? And I just want to spend a little time thinking about some of the options. And it's nice if you have feed and other resources that allow for some alternative management, you know, to go somewhere else. And I think about our, our young cows and trying to take care of those in this uh, time period. If, if I had the option, I would certainly be looking at trying to uh, manage their condition and perhaps their uh, good candidates for early weaning, but uh, really your, your resource options are going to drive a lot of those choices. And, you know, in some conditions we can market animals sooner, whether, whether it's uh, grass cattle or perhaps uh, your yearling replacement heifers. You're planning to sell those anyway, the, the opens, identifying those earlier. And then we get into those uh, groups of animals that might have been on our list um, from calving, older cows and bulls. And I think of cow of my own that uh, I'm not gonna milk her out for three days before calving again. She's just, it's time to go. So they failed some convenience traits and they're on your list. And then I think important and what we're going to focus on really today is understanding the value of some things that we can measure and uh, that's identifying these open cows and, and late bred and understanding the value in that information. And of course, uh, th there may be room for some that don't fit your genetic goals as, as part of those animals to destock, destock. And so we need information to make these decisions. And we need to understand, um, you know, the value and marketing options of these different groups. So uh, to start into that, I just created a scenario here with calves born on various days of the calving season and uh, generated weights for those. Use beef basis to put a value on a sales price and you see that those range uh, from $948 to $824. If we compare that to the total variable cost from our Kansas farm management data, you can see a, a difference in net income uh, comparing uh, those sales prices and uh, the, the var variable costs. So as we're thinking about what's it worth to know when a cow is pregnant, you know, you've got a 40 to $50 difference between uh, the calves that are born at various stages of the uh, calving season. The other factor to think about as we're looking at altering our schedule is if we're going to identify open and late bred cows going into the market, what's that market look like? And of course, this year we have lots of uh, things impacting the market and supply and demand for ground beef. But uh, I thought it might be useful to review this historical graph of seasonality in the cow market. And if anything, we might expect if we get more cows going to market sooner that that decline could occur sooner that we typically see with uh, more calves being weaned and, and cows going to market. So that uh, blue center line is kind of the average with uh, one standard deviation on either side of that. So it's something to keep in mind as we think about uh, 
how we might manage and when we uh, take action on trying to um, remove some cows from the herd. So identifying when cows are pregnant is important to do, and we have several methods and tools we can use to do that. So first off, uh, we've had palpation as our longtime uh, friend to determine pregnancy. The thing we have to remember in, the, in this case, as we're looking at trying to stage those pregnancies, is that certainly that precision uh, declines as that pregnancy advances, it drops over the pelvic rim, and then just variation in calf growth makes that less precise the further the pregnancy goes along. Ultrasound is probably our best tool for staging that pregnancies under 100 days. We can uh, practically start at 28 to 30 days. It takes a little longer on those really short-term pregnancies, but um, within that time period, we can do a pretty good job of, of staging those pregnancies. Now, another tool that we have is a blood test that looks at pregnancy-associated glycoproteins. And there are a bunch of those different proteins. And so depending on which test, you can uh, sample those as soon as 25 to 30 days after mating. If we want to use it to stage, though, we would need to repeat that sampling. And I'll review that briefly with you as well. So I just want to use this little illustration of a cumulative percent pregnant in a typical breeding season. We started out with essentially three, three cows out of 100 getting pregnant uh, in the first 20 days. And so you see about 60% of those are calved um, in the first 20 days and, and so on. And so what we want to look at then is if we want to stage these pregnancies, when should we do that to get the best information? And, and maybe another way to look at it is um, what kind of information can we get when? The first illustration is looking at a March 1 calving, so May 21st, turn the bulls out. 90 days after bull turnout is August 19th. And you can see that the first cow's bred would be about 90 days pregnant. The next cycle, anywhere from 50 to 70 days pregnant, and then um, so on. And I'm just showing that. 60% of those females would fall into that early category, and here 22%, and so on. And, and in this example, there would be 9% open, or if, if you're actually leaving bulls out longer, that would need to be rechecked. Um, the best tool in this range would be to use the ultrasound, but someone with good palpation skills would do uh, would be able to get down to about 35 days. It wouldn't probably get uh, as accurate down here at 30 days. So uh, this is a great time period to do ultrasound to stage those pregnancies. If we look at further options a little uh, longer after bull turnout, we see 110 days. And that gives us a range of 110 to 50 days. This would be a, a good time to use uh, palpation. A good technician should be able to do that. You'll begin to lose resolution on these uh, first two time periods, but that's probably not a major concern. Then as we go out another cycle, uh, you again are gonna lose resolution in terms of clearly predicting which cows are pregnant when this uh, you know, pregnancy has dropped over the pelvic rim by this point. So um, you'd still get some good information here with palpation, but uh, you begin to lose some resolution in doing that. So I understand there's challenges trying to work cows at different times of the year, but as we think about the value of those early bred calves, that helps you make a decision on whether or not you want to make that effort. If we look just briefly at using blood samples to stage pregnancies, I know this doesn't fit a lot of situations, but there probably are some that, that can make use of this and just important to kind of think about how you might go about that. 
And so in this case, you'd probably want to start sampling a little bit sooner. And so I'm starting sampling at 50 days after bull turnout. And that's going to identify those pregnant in that first cycle. Then coming back and repeating that sample about 20 days later, you wouldn't need to necessarily resample those that showed pregnant in the first sample but then you were going, would pick up all of those that were pregnant between essentially at this point 30 to 70 days. And then depending on, on your goals, uh, either resampling them all um, to make that fit. But it is possible, a little more work doesn't fit everything. So want to point out that there are three different blood tests, uh, commercially available test kits using a blood sample. They each use a different um, protein, so they have different days when they are, they, they say to start in terms of how short that pregnancy can be, as well as they hang around in the system longer. The illustration in the lower right simply shows um, the pregnancy associated glycoprotein concentration after calving and that declines, but it is high at calving. And that time period varies with the different proteins. So the, the reason to think about this is if you have a late calving cow that lost a calf that still turned out, she may be able to conceive and breed early yet still have high uh, PAG concentrations because of, of what she had at calving. So just understand uh, the limitations of those tests. And the other thing to point out in terms of the, this type of blood test is that if an embryo is lost, um, that level of PAG will still stay elevated for a while. And so if we compare ultrasound, we can see an art heartbeat that day, make action uh, to sorter, whatever we want to do, whereas the blood sample, we have to send that off. And we don't know, you know, the calf fetus could have died the day before, PAG is still high. So just understand some of the limitations. Um, additional value of staging those pregnancies, there is the ability then to manage those cows by stage of pregnancy, depending on how much, uh, how fine of information you have. We think about other marketing options, identifying AI sired. Uh, it is possible to fetal sex in the 60 to 100 day range, but it would probably require multiple palpations to include all your pregnancy data with that. Of course, fetal sexing does take um, more ultrasound skills to do that. And I think it's possible to increase the value of any pregnant cows you marketed if you could uh, indicate they were uh, targeted to target a certain stage of pregnancy as you marketed those. I wouldn't want to promise that dollar value, but if you're a good marketer, perhaps you can. So just to, to wind up thinking about uh, culling cows, I think there's Whenever we have a drought, it is an opportunity to kind of clean out some things that perhaps needed to, to go that we have delayed. Uh, certainly look at the value there is between those that are bred early versus later as you're considering what efforts you want to make to collect that information. Um, be aware of seasonal changes in the cow ma market and I think timely pregnancy diagnosis is a great tool and really fits this time of year. With that, uh, I'll turn it back over to uh, Bob for our next segment. Great, thanks, Sandy. That was uh, a really helpful and uh, insightful presentation on uh, kind of getting our, our arms around the, uh, the cow side and uh, certainly appreciate that. Um, we're gonna move to uh, our next speaker here uh, is gonna be Dr. Justin Wagner. And Justin, let me get uh, remote control passed over to you. Um, and hopefully, yeah, it looks like you've got it. So Dr. Wagner, the floor is yours. Uh, look forward to your comments here uh, as we kind of transition into some nutrition and supplementation commentary. All right, thanks, Bob. Appreciate the uh, <clears throat> opportunity for everyone to join us here today. Uh, I'm going to click this maybe back and see just to make sure I've got uh, 
got control here, Bob. Um, <clears throat> so as we think about, uh, you know, kind of addressing a, a shortage of forage uh, in a drought scenario, uh, I know a lot of times for producers, I always get the impression that, you know, as we begin to, to think about managing both uh, the quality of the forage we have and the supply of forage that we have, that that can be a little bit overwhelming. And so for me, you know, I like to break things down and, and keep it fairly simple. And, you know, there really are, there are four forage scenarios as we balance the quality of the forage and the supply of forage that, that we often run into. Um, you know, the two that, that we're really talking about today would be where we've got it is possible during a drought situation to have a high quality forage but a limited supply. Uh, the other side of that is as we begin to, to transition in the fall months, we may have some low quality forage, but we've got a, a limited supply of that as well. And so those are really kind of a change from our what I would call our normal um, supplementation scenarios. And, and so, you know, as I think about drought supplementation, it's, it's not necessarily um, a normal supplementation uh, situation. So if we really think about a normal supplementation program, um, this is going to be that scenario where we've got an adequate supply of low to moderate quality forage. Uh, typically that forage is going to be less than 7% crude protein and, and in that scenario protein is going to be the first limiting uh, thing that we think about or the nutrient that we think about supplying to those cows. As we get into a drought situation, or you have limited grazing, energy really becomes our first limiting nutrient followed by protein. Uh, a lot of times we're gonna have to begin to replace forage or hay with some sort of, of energy type supplement. Um, in, in addition to that, more often, in more times than, than not, we're gonna be looking at something of, along the lines of needing to feed a combination supplement uh, that supply both energy and protein to those cows. Um, so it is a little bit different than just that normal scenario where we'd look at meeting that cow's protein protein needs as we go through the winter months. Uh, I always like to remind people of what energy requirements and supply kind of looks like. This is the classic graph that, that I utilize to do that in a lot of different presentations where we look at three different types of cows that, that range from 12 to 1400 pounds and then then also throw in you know different levels of, of lactation potential into those cows. That brown box would represent what I would call a dormant forage base where those cows are able to consume 2.2% uh, of body weight per day. And so you can see how that dormant forage base on either ends of the spectrum where we've got those dry cows does a fairly good job of meeting the requirements of those cows. If we move into what I'd call a normal forage scenario and, and looking at energy, we can see that um, green forage, as long as a cow can, can consume or maximize their forage intake of that forage, we're going to easily cover most of those cows' requirements. Now, the question I've often started asking myself is, well, how much of a reduction in intake or a lack of forage availability does it take before we start to, to see some white space where that forage is unable to meet that cow's requirements? And, and for me, when we model that, uh, it looks like to me like it's about a 20% reduction in forage intake is, is where we start to see some of those gaps. And so, you know, as you think about it, that's really not that much uh, of a reduction in available forage. A lot of places here, especially in Southwest Kansas, I would say we're, we're, we might be experiencing that and, and we're probably already there. If we look at the difference between requirement and supply, um, even at this, this high quality forage where we've reduced that intake down to 1.76% uh, of body weight, uh, those cows in that scenario are, are likely going to be mobilizing some body condition. Depending on the cow that we're looking at, it could be anywhere from a quarter to three quarters of a body condition score per month. So those, those cows are certainly going to, to be mobilizing some condition reserves if we don't address it in, in terms of uh, supplementing those cows appropriately. You know, one of the other things that, that it, it's both a blessing, but it's, but it also creates an additional challenge for producers is we have access to more supplements today that we could feed a cow than, than probably what we've, we've had in, in mostly modern times. As we get into a drought scenario, I find a lot of producers tend to gravitate back towards hay and replacing that grazed forage intake. And sometimes we, we maybe miss an, an opportunity there to look outside at some other uh, supplements or some other feedstuffs that, that might fit our needs in terms of supplying both energy and protein to those cows very well. So it's important to start with nutrient composition and considering what we're actually buying as we purchase some, some supplemental feeds. Um, here's the nutrient composition of some various feedstuffs, uh, everything from corn to CRP hay. 
What I want to point out here in dress is if you look at the energy density of corn, we're looking at one megacal per pound. If we look at CRP hay, that's down in the in the the 0.2 range. And so quite a bit of difference in terms of, of looking at where those uh, differences were just between a forage and, and a concentrate in terms of corn. The other thing I want to point out is look at some of the byproducts and, and what they bring to the table. Uh, if we're looking in a situation, looking for a supplement in a situation where we need to provide both protein and energy, a lot of those byproducts are a pretty good fit. If you look at the protein content being around 30 uh, in the 30s and the energy content really being uh, somewhere between 90 and 95 percent of the energy that what what corn would bring to the to the table. The other important you know thing to keep in the back of my mind or the back of a producer's mind is that as we get into a drought scenario more often than not we're going to be bringing in feedstuffs from another part of the uh, we're going to have to put some wheels under and so that that freight can become a big part of the, the expense of bringing in a supplement lift. And a lot of, ex a perfect example of that is if we were to haul hay from Eastern Kansas to Western Kansas, we might be able to purchase that hay for $40 a ton, but we'd have well over $100 a ton into it by the time we got it to, to Western Kansas. So I think it's always important to consider how many megacals of energy are we hauling? You know, if we look at corn versus CRP hay and meeting those cows needs, What's the freight dynamics of, of moving that product to, to where we are and, and where we need it in a drought scenario? You know, something that also comes up as we begin to talk about um, supplement selection during a drought is this concept of fiber versus starch. And, and yes, fiber is preferred. We get less substitution. Uh, you know, we don't have the negative effects of starch in the rumen. Uh, however, we can utilize some starch-based supplements, especially if you look at corn, prices of that you know, typically going to be pretty economical. Uh, we can feed up to 0.3% of body weight without negatively impacting forage intake uh, of an energy or a starch-based supplement. Really what we're targeting is, is an energy and protein is, is what we both need in this scenario. Um, I'm kind of the mindset we, we can get you know, we can overthink this a little bit, I think, in terms of our supplementation. Um, you know, yes, fiber's better, but as we get into a drought, the bottom line is a cow has requirements uh, on a per day basis for energy, and they have um, those same requires, similar requirements for protein. So we, our goal ultimately is, is to meet those, meet those requirements. And if we have to give up some forage intake to do that, um, that may be something we need to look at. Uh, also start to think about, and this is just the basic, you know, type of things, is we look at a supplementation program, it's always based on the assumption that animals consume the supplement at the target amount. So are there things that we can do to reduce that variability? And if we're targeting that a cow consumes four pounds of a supplement per day, what can we do to ensure that that cow is going to consume that four pounds? One of the easiest things we can do is deliver those supplements on a daily basis. You know, in this drought scenario, we're going to be supplying both energy and protein. Uh, so we need to to, to do that on a daily basis, probably to see the best results. Look at delivery methods. You know, I think about hand feeding. I also think about bunks, reducing waste, um, all those things. If you've got access to use, putting those things in place. The other factor that's a big thing, we know there's some social behaviors that go into that target consumption amount. If you think about a two versus a four pound supplementation strategy, um, if we are feeding those cows in bunks, uh, is there something we can do to spread those cows out? My general recommendation is 20 inches per cow. The other thing we can do is simply sort cows and reduce some of those social behaviors, uh, those boss cows getting more of that supplement that's out there and pushing those younger or thinner cows back. Uh, so really starting to target, you know, making sure that each animal gets everything that they need. And the other thing that I, I really thought we needed to mention on the cow side was, you know, when do we move out of a scenario of where we're supplementing cows versus what I would call feeding cows? And, and you know, the, there is no uh, hard and fast rule. For me, it's if we're looking at a scenario where we're having to replace more than 50% of the daily forage intake of a cow, we, we're we getting close to that point where we may need to look at some other uh, feeding options. You can say a 1,400 pound cow is gonna consume 28 pounds of dry forage per day. Uh, you know, if we're feeding 12 to 15 pounds of hay per day, uh, that that might be a good benchmark to look at and say, you know, am I doing the right thing and is it the most economical? If we do get into that situation where we have to replace forage with concentrates, you know, if we look at the energy density of concentrates, they're going to be greater. If we're putting wheels under them, we talked about the freight dynamics, that's probably going to be a little more economical. 
one of the tools that we can pull out that works quite well uh, if we do have to to lock cows up and, and move into what I would call a dry lot environment with a set of cows is, is limit feeding. This is just simply that concept where we restrict the intake relative to the predicted or ad libitum intake of those cows. You know, typically for me, it's we're feeding an energy dense uh, diet, so a concentrate based diet, typically at around 1.8% of body weight or 2% of body weight, as opposed to a forage based diet that's going to be fed at somewhere around 2.5% of body weight. So when we do this, it, it becomes, uh, we see some efficiencies in, in terms of feeding those cows. It can also be a very cost effective strategy in terms of cost per unit of energy in, in meeting those cows' requirements. So let's talk a little bit about the calf side of things and, and early weaning. Uh, I always feel that it's a really good idea to, to define what we mean by early weaning. Uh, to me, weaning, early weaning is simply weaning a calf at less than 180 days of age. Uh, conventional weaning, typically going to be somewhere between 180 to 220 days of age. We know we can, we can wean calves as early as 45 days. Uh, for me, in terms of a practical application on a weaned calf, and you'll see this in some of the data that I'm going to walk you all through today, is that, you know, a calf that's on average going to be 120 days of age, um, those calves just seem to, to do very well when we wean them regardless of the environment that we put them in, whether that's a dry lot or we put them back out on pasture, they just seem like that that goes very well. So, you know, practical application, we're looking at 120 days of average. So if you think about your normal calving distribution and where you'd be at in that, we're typically looking at calves would be somewhere between 100 to 150 days of, of age. So a couple of the benefits of, of early weaning, you know, the first one, we, our first presenter, uh, Dr. Johnson, talked about, you know, reducing grazing pressure. And one of the things to keep in mind is, you know, calves do consume forage in a pasture scenario. We've got some, some older data from, from Dr. Boggs. We look at dry forage intake of, of springborn calves. Uh, as we get into the month of July and August, it's somewhere between one and a half to 1.7% uh, of their body weight that those calves are consuming in dry forage. So that means a 450 pound calf that's 120 days of age is gonna consume really close to, to seven pounds of dry forage per day. Uh, if you look at a lactating uh, cow weighs 1400 pounds, that's gonna be somewhere around that 30 pounds of dry forage per day. Uh, if we make her a dry cow, we reduce that down to 27. So I like to think about drought as kind of a, it's a game of, of grazing days and grazing days turns into to weeks of grazing and, and how long can I maintain cows on, on this unit of grass or within this pasture. So for every four days that the calf is, is not grazing, I get one grazing day back for my cow. And so if I wean 30 days early, if we do the math, we can get about a week of additional grazing on that, that pasture unit just by simply weaning those calves. The other benefit that I think we probably don't talk about enough in terms of early weaning, we tend to focus on the, on the, the calf side of the performance, but I think the big advantage here is in body condition score of the cows and what we can gain. A few years ago at K-State, um, uh, Dr. Casey Olson designed a study to actually look at preconditioning duration, and in that study they weaned calves at, at different ages. And so this is the body condition score of those cows uh, in that study of calves that were weaned from 100 to 160 days of age. And as you look at this table, one of the things you'll, that I want you to focus on is the body condition score change. Uh, if we look at those, those calves that were weaned at 100 days of age all the way to 160, at the 160 um, day old calves, you know, not much change there. But if we look at the condition score uh, of those cows that were weaned, uh, which the cows were weaned at 100 to 130 days of age, those cows are picking up in, in 60 days, uh, somewhere between a, a three, at least a quarter um, to a half a condition score and body condition. The other thing in, a, in another study that was conducted at K-State, and, and this was actually part of a supplementation study that was a multi-year study. Um, and in the first year of the study, due to drought conditions, it was conducted in 2013, uh, the calves had to be weaned early. Uh, and so, what we were able to do with that study was actually capture um, what body condition score looked like at calving on a set of cows that were normal weaned in the first year and then early weaned in the second year. And so we see the, the three uh, supplementation treatments there. 
what we see is those cows, you know, in year one, we, we calved in a condition score really five, four, five, four, five, two. We implemented the early weaning and that next year, those cows were, were calving in a body condition score really closer to six. So we gained that half a condition score by early weaning in those cows and we also carried it forward to calving. So, so I think that's another really big advantage as, as we begin to think about early weaning and what it can do in terms of the, the cattle management system. So let's talk a little bit about the just the management of some newly weaned calves and, and what that kind of looks like. And I think one of the things that we often maybe take for granted a little bit or what we simply don't think about is, is how little feed those calves are going to consume um, when they come in or, or when we wean them. Uh, typically dry matter intake is very low. Uh, anywhere from one to one and a half percent of body weight would be fairly normal. So in an early weaning scenario, a lot of times we're going to be weaning calves that are going to weigh around 400 pounds. So if you look at that, you know, 1% of body weight, that's only four pounds of, of dry feed per day. Uh, as we begin to progress those calves up on feed and we get out to, to say somewhere around 2% uh, of body weight in terms of intake, it's going to be anywhere up to two to two and a half percent. It's going to put us in that eight to 10 pounds of dry feed per head per day that those calves are going to consume. Uh, that's that's not a lot of feed and and so you know our diet has to change a little bit especially given the fact that these calves have a fairly high nutrient requirement so so intake is is really critical to the success of an early weaning program and so one of the things I like to think about is what can I do or what can a producer do to, to help those calves better make that transition so that they are uh, consuming feed upon arrival at, at a at a facility or when they come into the dry lot. And, and one of the things that, that uh, I like to consider is, is there something that, that's pretty easy that, that we can do? Uh, this is some data from a study that looked at uh, a PhD study. Um, it actually measured the number of calves that were observed at the bunk during a feedlot receiving period. Now, in this particular study, these calves were exposed to, to three different, what I would call weaning protocols. The green line would represent some calves that were dry lot weaned. Uh, the blue line would represent some calves that were pasture weaned that had fence line contact with the dam plus a supplement that, that was fed in a bunk. And then we have some pasture weaned calves that did not have any supplement that just had fence line contact with the dam. So, so kind of that historic soft wean type program. Uh, so if you look at, you know, what, what are the take home uh, away from this graph? Well, to me, it's exposure to a bunk matters. Those calves had, had seen a bunk, they knew what it was, and so the first day when they came into the feedlot, what did they do? They went to the bunk and consumed feed. So if we think about a set of early wean calves, or even any time we're weaning, exposing those calves to a bunk, maybe putting some of that supplement or that ration, or if we're gonna use a commercial, commercial starter diet, in front of those calves when they're with the cow, prior to bringing them into the, to the dry lot or into the weaning facilities can go a long ways towards helping those calves consume feed uh, upon arrival. So let's talk about maybe having a plan and what that plan looks like. At, at K-State, we've, we've done several different, what I would call weaning studies over the years. Uh, this is a protocol that, that really was developed and it's been put in place at the, the Agricultural Research Center in Hayes for a number of years. It kind of you know, hinges off that concept that those calves are not going to consume a lot of feed initially when they come into to the facility and, and how we start them on that weaning ration. Uh, so if we look at that initially, those calves are gonna receive about a half percent of body weight in, in that weaning diet and about a half percent of a really high quality grass hay. That first day, we'll put the diet on the bottom and the hay on top. We thought being those calves are fairly accustomed to consuming, you know, some, uh, forages that they're going to eat through that that hay and then get down into the ration there. And as you look at it, we stepwise uh, stepwise increase the amount of weaning diet that those calves are receiving, and we leave the hay about the same. And the goal with this program is to start those calves out to where they're consuming about 1% of body weight on the first day they come into the facility. But by about day seven or eight, we're, we're really getting close to having those calves consume uh, somewhere around that 1.8 to 2% of their body weight uh, of that weaning ration, which is going to be tailored, uh, fairly high concentrate level, meeting those energy and the protein requirements for those calves. So I think there's a lot to be said for, for having a plan about how we're going to address those calves. The other thing I like about this program is it keeps those calves fairly aggressive. 
A lot of producers, uh, when we wean calves, they tend to want to just put more feed in front of them, put more feed in front of them. And a lot of times that can be a, a recipe for really getting some erratic intakes by about day three or four of the program. So in terms of the diet, we've talked about this a little bit. Those calves have a relatively high uh, requirements in terms of energy and protein. Um, so we're gonna to have to have a relatively you know, nutrient dense diet, especially to offset those low intakes. The, the challenge becomes is that the feedstuffs like a grass hay, they're not necessarily nutrient dense that those uh, calves are gonna be the most familiar with. The other thing that we oftentimes run into is that some of the, the ingredients that we're gonna put in front of those calves um, might be, they may not be familiar with. So we really try to limit the inclusion of silage and even some of the wet byproducts, uh, for example, is, is something to think about. Uh, most important is, is palatability. Um, you know, you think about, you know, I think about moisture level uh, 20 to 30 percent, which means in some cases, you know, where we are using some wet byproducts or silage, you know, it, it's very easy to get a wet ration in front of those calves. The other thing with calves is it comes back to palatability and these moisture levels is calves will sort the diet uh, probably more so than other classes of cattle. And so making sure we get those diet ingredients aggregated well, getting a good mix, um, cattle like those young calves, stressed cattle will actually tend to sort out the concentrates more than the roughages, um, uh, which is, is a little bit interesting, I, I've always thought. Uh, you know, the other thing we've got to think about is a lot of the facilities, especially in early wean calves, there's a big difference between weaning five and 600 pound calves in a facility and, and then go to getting into those calves that are going to weigh three to 400 pounds. Um, I like to recommend the calves, you know, we pin them based on body size. Um, you know, if we can limit that weight range within a pin to, to 50 pounds, uh, that can be a good thing. A lot of times just sexing steers and heifers can be a good way to do that. In terms of bunk space, we've got to have at least 12 inches uh, per calf. There's, there's really no, I guess, official recommendation, but I, I think that's, that's kind of a minimum that we would need to have out there. Um, the other thing is the bunk and water tank height. You know, a lot of times it's really common to get some holes or some drop-offs, uh, especially if it's a feedlot that, that's had larger cattle in it. Um, you know, taking the time to do some pin maintenance, put in some additional fill around the water tank and maybe even the bunks in some cases. Um, a lot of times as, as we're weaning these springborn calves, we're gonna be in the heat of the summer, you know, late July, August. We get a lot of questions about, you know, shade and, and what that can do. And there's certainly some benefits to that. Um, you know, we need to consider airflow in those pens, maybe spreading cattle out, um, looking at, at mound design. You know, if you don't have enough shade for all the calves to get under, um, that can be just as bad as, uh, can create a bad scenario as well, because those calves will just simply try to crowd up underneath that and reduce the airflow that's available to them. So as I think about the pen environment, um, you know, a lot of pens are, are structured for larger cattle where we've got more square footage. The other concern would be dust. Uh, especially in the drier months of the year. One of the simple things, and, and we've had to do this in our facilities at Hayes just because our pens are very deep. Uh, when we wean into those, those type of pens, we'll often take some portable panels and set them up across the back of the pen, reduce that, that pen surface area that those calves have got access to. And, and really it, it does two things for us. One, it, it keeps those calves closer to the bunk. It also increasing that pen density, reduces our dust problems. Uh, if we do get into some walking behaviors, um, it's, it's just less distance for those calves to walk, and so there's less energy expenditure in doing that. So that can be something to think about, given that most pens um, for in some facilities are, are probably going to be for, for larger cattle than what we're going to be weaning on these, these early weaned calves. Um, so let's talk about some misconceptions that I think are out there. A lot of times when I, I bring up early weaning with producers, they often assume that, that early wean calves are going to be lightweight, high-risk calves, and that, and, and, and that they're not going to have the ability and they have a low performance potential. And, and really, that's not the case. I mean, early wean calves, if they're from the ranch of origin, that's very different from a feedlot calf that's been exposed to those stressors. Calves can utilize concentrate feeds well. Um, you know, if we look at similar pull rates uh, compared to conventional uh, cattle. If we also look at these calves, you know, the, the feed to gain sometimes are, are very impressive on these calves. And so I wanted to share some performance data. Um, a lot of times, especially right now, uh, you know, we need to know 
what the program and how these cattle are going to gain. And so this is that same preconditioning study where weaned calves of different ages, those designs by Dr. Olson. Uh, if we look at these, you know, weaned calves from 100 to 160 days of age, uh, if we look at the, the average daily gains here, they're going to range from, you know, really one and a half to, to all the way up to two pounds per day. If we look at those calves that would be 130 days of age, 145 days of age, we're right there in that, that two pounds a day uh, range on, on these calves. In terms of, of morbidity or treatment or pull rate, depending on how you want to look at that, uh, our incidence of disease, uh, this, this is not different. Uh, there was no, no effect. There are some numerical differences here. But really, we're only seeing a, uh, you know, morbidity of around 4% in those 100-day-old those calves. And it goes, does go down roughly half in those calves as, as they get a little bit older. So another early weaning study that was conducted at K-State, we wanted to compare really, I, I would call it two different systems to, to wean some calves in. We utilized some 113-day-old calves and some 144-day-old calves that originated from, from two of our facilities. Uh, some of these calves, half of them went into a dry lot program, the other went into a pasture program uh, following weaning. Uh, our dry lot program was what I would call maybe a little more intense. We were feeding those calves to achieve a two pound, 2.2 uh, average daily gain and, and a target intake of 2.2% of body weight. And so I wanna share the, some of the particulars. If you look at the weaning diet that we fed, see it's relatively energy dense, um, 0.85, uh, really almost 19% crude protein uh, off the start. We did have some silage in here, so it just shows that you know you can utilize that at a very low level. Um, but really, what you know, I wanted to to kind of highlight in in putting this study in in front of everyone this afternoon was just the performance of these calves in the dry lot. You know, we were weaning uh, 360 uh, pound calves. If we look at that final body weight, uh, you can see that we went there. If we look at the average daily gain, we're right at that two pound a day target. Um, our consumptions were, were right in line there. Uh, if we look at the feed to gain, we're looking at a, at a, a feed conver conversion in the fours, the low fours. Um, if you look at our, our incidence of fever, uh, you, we're running about 7%. Um, that's a little higher than the other study, but it's still fairly low in that dry lot program. The calves that went out to pasture, uh, this is, is a real world studies. We had some issues with pink eye, as you can see, where they treated about 40% of the calves for pink eye. So as you would expect, the performance of those calves was, was really substantially impacted by that. Um, but I think what's exciting as I look at this is, you know, in that intensive managed system, these calves really performed right on target for us and, you know, posted a pretty exciting feed conversion uh, in terms of you know, if we ran the economics of that, uh, that's something that, that we probably don't look at enough. You know, the last thing is, as I kind of wrap up as we think about supplementation programs and early wean calves, you know, calf value in, in any weaning scenario is really a function of weight gain. If we're going to, you know, take the time and effort to, to put those calves in, and put them through this program, they've got to perform, they've got to gain weight. And the first thing for them to be able to do that is we've got to get feed consumption uh, in those calves. You know, the other thing with early wean calves, they're gonna fit a variety of marketing programs that are out there, but we have to have kind of a marketing plan in place. We may need to, there's a third party verification behind that for some steps that we need to take to do that. That's not something that we can implement kind of at the end of the program. We need to be thinking about that at, at the beginning of the program. Dr. Johnson highlighted beefbasis.com. I think it's a, a really great tool to be able to look at the value of gain relative to the cost of gain. Another important consideration that we need to look at is when are we gonna market those calves as, as we begin to build those programs and, and move it forward. But uh, you know, early weaning uh, is really a great strategy as we look at younger females, uh, allowing them to put some additional body condition score and, and a great tool as well to, to utilize when we're in a drought scenario. So with that, I'm, I'm going to wrap up and uh, turn the floor back over to Dr. Weber uh, for our next speaker. Thanks, Justin. That was uh, outstanding. And uh, I'm always, uh, uh, I've seen, seen the K-State data on those uh, feeding trials a number of times, and I'm always amazed at how well, you know, those early wean calves actually can do in terms of uh, calf performance and, and feed conversion. Um, 
at, at a relatively young age really can uh, get some outstanding performance out of those calves and and the health um, of them when managed right uh, can work work very well uh, in addition so um, to speak on that uh, that part of the side uh, or part of the scenario is uh, our next speaker dr. Uh, AJ Tarpoff and uh, uh, Dr. Tarpoff's a veterinarian, has a fair bit of background both in uh, sort of production medicine uh, and, and feed yard medicine um, and has been a, a valued, uh, valued uh, member of our team here for a number of years uh, at K-State. And uh, with that, AJ, I think uh, uh, you've got control of the slides. So um, uh, the floor is yours, my friend. All right. Thank you, Dr. Weber. Um, and thank you for all the attendees that are tuning in. Um, so yes, uh, doc, uh, Dr. Wagner actually brought up, uh, you know, early weaning, um, and what I really wanted to address today was dealing with some health considerations of some of these younger calves. Because uh, when, when we start thinking about these early weaned calves, um, you know, what are we dealing with? Are we dealing with the same type of animal? Well, essentially, no. Uh, if we think about calves as kids, it's uh, getting them prepared for preschool instead of getting them prepared for high school, so to speak. Okay, and our goal is to better prepare the health and well-being of these animals for the next stage of production. Ultimately, that's what we're trying to do, okay? Uh, to introduce what, you know, what I'll discuss here, um, I, I do want to talk about the calf's immune system, okay? Where is the calf's immune system during these different stages on when we potentially either regularly wean or if we're going to early wean? Okay, um, and this, I think this chart uh, really describes well of what's happening with the calf and its immune function. Uh, early in life, all of its immune function is actually coming from the colostral antibodies from it, its dam. Okay, uh, now while its active immune system it begins working soon after birth, at birth, uh, it really has never been exposed and is really uh, naive. Okay, now after a couple months of age, that really starts to take over as the maternal antibody starts to wane. Okay, and there's periods of time there that we kind of refer to as the window of susceptibility for disease. Okay, and that falls within the window of uh, between uh, weaning and just prior to. Okay, so are there some things that we can do to help increase some of the immune function during this time? Okay, so again, naive at birth. Absorption of colostral antibodies is critical for the health and well-being of those animals early in life. But then the calf's immune system does start to take over, okay? It will have full adaptive immunity that it's responding to everything as those maternal antibodies wane by five to eight months or so, okay? Now, the maternal antibody does start to decline right around the same time we traditionally uh, refer to as branding time, okay? When that calf is two to four months of age, we have the maternal antibody that is starting to decrease as its own immune function is starting to increase. Okay, so those are kind of prime times when we, we can uh, institute some different programs and health techniques to be able to modify and increase uh, some of the protection in these calves as their immune system is really developing. Okay, uh, the question always comes up, so I throw it in is, you know, well, doc, how early can you vaccinate? right? Uh, I know a lot of you may have asked that yourselves. Uh, you know, traditionally, our, we respond to that as, you know, two to four months of age within that period of branding time, we get reliable responses to the vaccines. At least the animal's immune function uh, responds in a way to develop memory, okay? So if they see some of those antigens, if they see some of those pathogens and bugs in the environment, uh, their immune system is able to respond to it. They recognize it and they're able to respond a little bit better with better protection. Uh, there's been recent trials and some recent work that have uh, shown we, we still get some pretty decent protection in memory uh, if, they, if they're exposed later in life, even when we vaccinate up to a month of age. Uh, so again, talk to, your, talk to your veterinarian, okay? They can, your local practitioner, uh, you know, have these conversations on what to use, uh, product selection, and when to use these products, okay? Uh, some of the data that I'm going to be sharing with you is from a survey that we uh, we did a national survey, uh, both with uh, the K-State Vet School uh, uh, Animal Science, as well as uh, teamed up with Red Angus. And this is a survey that we asked about 150 practicing veterinarians to deal mostly with cow-calf operations within the United States on what their recommend recommendations are. Okay, and specifically when we ask questions about early weaning, it falls in line very much with what Dr. Wagner mentioned earlier on what is considered an early wean. 
okay? And somewhere between that, uh, you know, 75 and a little over 120 days, somewhere in there is, is kind of the, our basic recommendation if we're gonna early wean how old that animal is. Uh, so it does fall in line very nice with our survey information with, with some other recommendations that are out there. Now, if we're gonna be talking about the immune system, okay, uh, you know, we, we've, we've already discussed uh, quality nutrition, uh, weaning environment, things, things like that. Uh, but specifically when we're dealing with very young, early, early weaned animals, we have to keep in mind that they don't have the maturity of their immune system. Okay, so that is a little bit of a detriment. Uh, the older the calf gets, the more functional and the stronger that immune response is going to be. We have a younger calf, so it will be a little weaker. Okay, so that just means for us, it, we really need to manage and really deal with the things that hinder or hurt some of our immune function in those calves. And I break that down very simply into stress, all different types of stress, okay? Is weaning stressful? Yes, weaning is stressful. If we can manage that to help uh, minimize some of the impacts on those animals, it, it will be for the added benefit. Uh, again, changes in feed, weather, management practices, such as castration and dehorning, these are all stressful events that we need to make sure that we manage appropriately so we don't have compounding stressors at the same time uh, that can ultimately lead to disease, okay? We can vaccinate, we can do different things to modify the immune system to prepare this calf. However, if we compound too many stressors at the same time, we can ultimately, uh, we can ultimately lead to disease and sickness, uh, usually bovine respiratory disease or pneumonia, okay? So how do, we, how do we minimize some of these compounding stressors? Okay, well first we can, we, can, we can prepare the calf through some of our animal health products, okay? Our animal health product utilizations and namely vaccinations, right? Uh, we're, and keep in mind a vaccine is a challenge to the immune system, okay? Uh, we want, want to have an animal that is ready to respond, that is in a low stress environment, that is healthy. We vaccinate them, they respond, it is a challenge to their system, but then they, they recover from that challenge and, and have a much stronger immune function. Uh, our biggest concern with these early wing calves is mostly bovine respiratory disease or BRD. Uh, when should we start some of these vaccine program? Traditionally, we kind of start vaccinating at, at branding time, at two to four months of age. Uh, that's where we are still targeting and priming for some of these young calves. Uh, but we need to make sure that it's, it's done well ahead of, of when we plan on weaning. So it does come down to planning. Uh, this isn't a, a split second decision on, oh, we're gonna early wean today. Uh, have a plan in place, discuss this with your veterinarian, make sure there's products available uh, to be able to utilize that you have planned ahead and prepared these animals before that early wean. What do we vaccinate against, okay? Uh, in a real basic level, uh, we vaccinate for our clostridial diseases. This is uh, referred to as our, our black legs, okay? Our seven or eight ways, even nine ways uh, that we have available out there. Uh, if you're gonna uh, choose clostridials, uh, don't forget about tetanus. Uh, not all of these multivalent vaccines uh, have tetanus. So especially if you're gonna be banding or dehorning uh, some of these calves uh, prior to weaning, uh, make sure that, that either you have included with tetanus uh, or we, we're actually giving that in, in, a, in a second shot. Um, also, our respiratory viruses is what we often protect against. That would be our five-way uh, five viral vaccines. Um, and then also we have our, our respiratory bacterins, okay? And these bacterins, these are, this is the bacterial bug that causes pneumonia, okay? Which would be Mannheimia, okay? Mannheimia hemolytica um, is, is often what we refer to as some of, some of our bacterin products and what's, what's included. Uh, so you all know that I'm, I'm not making up these recommendations. Within the survey of, of our nationwide survey of practicing veterinarians, uh, we asked the, uh, the practicing vets exactly that question. Okay, what do you recommend at different stages to prepare that calf for weaning? And for, uh, for vaccine practices and product administration uh, of calves at branding, that two to four months of age, uh, what is recommended? And as you can see here on the left-hand side, uh, you know, most, uh, the vast majority of veterinarians uh, do recommend a five-way viral, which would be the IBR, BVD, BRSV, and PI3, along with a multivalent clostridial vaccine, okay? Uh, of respondents, 88% of respondents do recommend a modified live viral uh, vaccine as opposed to a killed product during that period of time. Now, also, what is all, uh, often recommended is that we we booster, okay, those, those branding vaccines, or traditionally is more of a pre-weaning vaccine. 
Okay, so we can challenge that animal to have a second dose or a booster dose after branding, but before weaning. Okay, so this before weaning vaccine, uh, do some of the recommendations change? And they do change slightly. Uh, most veterinarians uh, still recommend, uh, if not all the, the veterinarians do recommend a, a five-way five modified live viral vaccine along with a clostridial. But what is often added into addition of this is our Mannheimia Bacterium product, okay, pre-weaning. Again, even more, 90% of uh, responding veterinarians do recommend a modified live uh, uh, viral at this period of time. Now, some of you might ask, why do we have, we already vaccinated them once, why do we need to give another dose? Okay, and, and that's a great question. And that comes down to how the immune uh, system responds to these vaccines, responds to these challenges. Oftentimes, especially with these young calves, is the initial dose is, is a primer, so to speak, where the calf's immune system actually responds, it recognizes the bug, but we don't get a huge antibody protection response floating through the system, okay? But the calf's immune system recognizes it, creates some memory, uh, but it's not a full response. When we give the booster, we get a much larger response, and that's referred to as an, an amnestic response. We get a much larger response with that booster uh, because the, the immune system has a second chance at recognizing that, and it's already created memory, okay? So we create a much bigger, uh, much more robust immune response with those second doses. So that's essentially why we give multiple doses to better prepare these calves for the stress of weaning and beyond. Now, to keep that in mind, uh, just because we administered a vaccine and we put the needle in the neck and we, we gave it a two cc dose of a product does not necessarily mean that that animal is gonna respond to that product. Uh, within a, you know any population, we typically have three different groups. Uh, we have some uh, uh, almost freaks of nature that respond extremely well to the vaccines that we give. Uh, we have another small group of population that unfortunately their immune system, they just don't respond very well. Okay, and, that, and that's understood. Not every animal is going to respond the same. Uh, but our ultimate goal is that the vast majority of our animals uh, that we administer a vaccine will, uh, will actually have an adequate response to what we give them. Okay, so keep in mind just gives, because we put a needle in, uh, does not mean that animal fully responded like they should. There's always a small percentage that unfortunately do not. Okay, weaning. Uh, Dr. Wagner already covered weaning and the stresses and different ways to mitigate some of those stresses, so I'm not going to uh, dive into that much, but acclimation, low stress, minimizing some of the compounding stressors is critical. Uh, now, I do briefly want to mention uh, some of our other management considerations, which would be castration and dehorning. Okay, uh, I, I think it's put very delicately that the longer uh, testicles are attached to the calf, the more that the calf is attached to them, okay? So uh, if we can castrate earlier in life, uh, much earlier in life, uh, um, way before weaning, so we can actually uh, very much separate and not compound those stressors at the same time, we can minimize the impact that we have on those animals. Uh, there are several studies that are available out there that really show uh, you know, much better performance, much better, uh, less hinder on those animals when we perform these painful procedures early in life. Okay, so timing is everything, uh, making sure that we're getting these done well before that early weaning time. Uh, because we know if we wait to do that at at weaning or after, especially if we're going to be retaining these animals and feeding them for a period of time, uh, that bulls, uh, if bulls arrival into the feedlot as calves, uh, do have about 140% higher morbidity, 140% higher mortality once they enter the feedlot. Okay, so uh, the earlier in life, if we can wait, uh, the much better that we can do. Uh, castration methods, okay, uh, we did ask those uh, for those recommendations for, uh, you know, what do vets recommend at different stages, whether they're at branding or weaning? Again, knife cut is a uh, is uh, much more much highly recommended earlier in uh, earlier in life, uh, but it, banding does does occur quite a bit as well, uh, and actually increases as as the animal gets older, which is uh, another another uh, discussion altogether. Uh, but regardless, if you're going to be castrating, uh, ninety seven percent of veterinarians do recommend that uh, you know to give calves a tetanus. Uh, tetanus toxoid vaccine when banding, okay? And that is just to the increased risk that if you're gonna be using a ban, uh, if, you, if you are gonna be using a ban, it increases uh, that animal's risk of developing tetanus. So 
uh, other stressors to be able to uh, mitigate and to be able to keep in mind that if we can minimize stress in, in, in any period of time for these calves, uh, parasite control, all different types of parasite control. That has to do with internal nematodes, gastrointestinal worms. Um, you know, and these are these are things that we treat with with our injectables, our porons, our oral products that we can administer. Again, work with your veterinarian for recommendations. Uh, when we early wean and the stress of weaning itself, it is a good idea to have the conversation and be prepared to deal with uh, different types of internal parasite issues like toxidiosis, okay, where we can get some uh, bloody diarrhea and some straining in some of those calves. Uh, so again, uh, you know, that, that's one thing to consider is be, be prepared for coccid, okay, whether that's either feeding a coccidiostat uh, or developing a treatment uh, to be able to administer in the feed or the water. Uh, and external parasites. Uh, yes, we're in a drought condition and some of the, but it seems like these external parasites ju just don't go away between flies and ticks, uh, making sure that we're prepared and we can treat those animals uh, prior, to the, uh, prior to weaning to decrease as much stress as we can. So to briefly wrap up, I, I'm gonna go over this last little bit uh, uh, pretty quickly. Uh, and this is really developing the, is preconditioning, uh, is using a certified preconditioned program right for you. Okay, is maintaining these animals post weaning right for you? These are good questions to ask. Uh, number one, do you have the facilities? Number two, do you have the time and labor? Okay, do you have help to be able to manage these young calves? Um, again, going back to what my colleagues mentioned, understanding the costs and benefits um, and the economics behind uh, both preconditioning, early weaning, and maintaining those animals for a period of time, utilizing product, uh, you know, some of the resources like beef bases to better understand that. Um, and then using a certified precondition program, uh, have you found that specific marketing opportunity? Have you done your homework? Have you made the contacts to be able to, uh, you know, maximize the value that you can receive for the cats? And that's, that's kind of a challenge uh, uh, to everyone, okay? We can always uh, do a little bit better on the marketing front. Again, there's, very, uh, there's various preconditioned programs that are verified and certified. Uh, do your homework, work, work with your veterinarian, they'll be able to work with you um, to be able to help certify a lot of these programs within your CAPS. Uh, you know, the question always comes up, at, are there premiums? You know, does it really pay? Uh, you know, this is from some superior data that back in, you know, in 2018, uh, you know, the unweaned back, 40, uh, back 34 uh, calves, you know, were receiving about a $3 a hundred weight. Uh, through that, those superior online sales, uh, as opposed to some of the VAC45 programs that have all the uh, requirements for different vaccine series, uh, but we're also weaned for 45 days. You know, what, what was the added uh, perceived value from those uh, within those sales? And that was about uh, $6, okay? Uh, there's plenty of other information that's out there, but one study in particular that always jumps out at me about the value of preconditioned animals is, is this. Uh, there was a very nice study that was done out of Indiana that looked at returns on investment from preconditioning over over uh, multiple years, uh, about a decade. Um, and, and what they found is the, the returns were primarily due to added weight, okay? Dr. Wagner al already talked about the ability of these calves to be able to, to gain, to be able to convert. Uh, the 63% of the value from those animals in these preconditioned programs actually came from selling a heavier weight animal not necessarily from the lower health, health risk of, of the premium itself. Uh, so it, it is a twofold, having a certified health program, but also uh, being able to capture some of that early, uh, early weight gain for a period of time to sell a heavier calf, okay? Uh, and again, uh, the, it's, it's pretty well documented of, of some of the returns. So again, for, for marketing, um, make sure that you, you know, that. The, you, you do your added homework, you, you have more conversations, especially with whether it's a local sale, sale barn, uh, whether you're uh, selling through uh, different types of online auctions. Uh, you know, are, are they specific sales for preconditioned animals of that size? You know, are there buyers that are going to be interested in, in, in that sale? Uh, so making sure that we target those sales, target those time frames to be able to, to uh, try to maximize the value uh, we can get. Again, uh, documented and verified, work with your veterinarian. A lot of times that's, that's where those uh, programs are verified through. And make sure that we, we try to get as much information as we can uh, into the person that's helping us sell and also in, into the buyer who's, who's interested in, in purchasing these calves. Uh, so there's, there's always value that, that hopefully we can capture and it all starts with communication. So with that, uh, thank you for your time. I'll turn it back over to uh, Dr. Weber to wrap up, and I think we will uh, begin answering questions.
Great, thanks, AJ, and uh, uh, that was uh, some some really helpful um, uh, guidelines on uh, particularly the early calf uh, weaning, but uh, more broadly just calf management in general and, and vaccination strategies and so forth. Um, uh, our first question is actually uh, um, pointed your direction, so it says, uh, uh, Dr. Tarpoff, uh, how much of a risk do modified live vaccines and suckling calves pose to pregnant cows if the cows have not been vaccinated with ML or modified live vaccines? Um, and then the, a follow-up question, or what are your thoughts on giving tetanus antitoxin uh, at time of castration? Okay. So excellent questions. And so for the first one, um, you know, is there a risk of giving a modified live to a calf, a suckling calf, if the dam has not been vaccinated with a modified live? Um, you know, and I do have to refer back to, um, you know, make sure you follow both the label directions, but also your local veterinarian's recommendations. Uh, you know, there, I, I'll be honest, there, there have been uh, reported cases of when we vaccinate calves with a modified live viral, uh, you know, they, they actually get viremic for a short period of time. They, sh they can actually shed some of that, that vaccine virus, uh, which is very normal. That's, that's, it needs to spread through the body in order for the body to recognize it and respond uh, very similarly how a wild type virus would. Um, you know, there, there have been a, a few, very few unique cases that they were able to determine that uh, that viremia was able to get spread to the cow. Uh, so that's that's why it's on the label. Uh, but again, talk to your veterinarian, uh, your local veterinarian about what those perceived risks are. Uh, what are the best products that are recommended? I, I will say that uh, most, uh, it, basically all of our uh, all of our uh, verified preconditioned programs do require use of uh, modified live products. Um, so again, it's it's a balance of management and uh, being prepared for that, uh, you know, prior to uh, prior to utilizing these. So it, it is part of the planning ahead. Uh, so I, I will refer, you know, the first question: uh, Where does the risk come from? And yes, we do have documented cases of of uh, some of the viral strains uh, causing an abortion in the cow that was not exposed to that strain before. Uh, so that that's why it's on the label. So follow the label directions. Work with your veterinarian. As for thoughts on giving tetanus and antitoxin at time of castration. Um, so tetanus uh, doesn't follow all the rules. There, it, it, it does have a regionality that it seems to thrive better in certain soils. Uh, you know, here, here in Kansas, uh, the further south and the further east you go, southeast Kansas, uh, you know, is, is a little bit more notorious with dealing with tetanus issues. Um, so ideally, uh, if we could give the, uh, the tetanus toxoid uh, at least three weeks prior to and a booster at, at castration, uh, we should have adequate uh, response and coverage. Okay, not always are we able to uh, give the tetanus three weeks in advance. Um, so giving it a tetanus uh, and, and a toxin at the same time, uh, they work very separately. Okay, so the, the tetanus toxoid, uh, it, it's, it's, it, it's actually a vaccine that challenges the immune system. The immune system has to respond. Okay, uh, the antitoxin is a preformed antibody that goes to work immediately. Okay, uh, they're typically short lived. Um, our antitoxins that are available are actually of, of equine or horse origin, uh, but it, it does have effect in, in cattle. Uh, both products can be administered at the same time, of course, uh, work with your veterinarian on that. Uh, so we, if we use both at the same time or one or the other, uh, Antitoxins don't have long lasting immunity. It's just an antibody that gets in and it, it wanes off. Uh, when we give a toxoid, the, the body actually responds to that and we actually have a higher level of, of immunity for a longer period of time. Uh, but we may have a, a lag if we give, it, if, if we give uh, the toxoid immediately at uh, castration, especially if they're gonna be in an environment of, uh, of extremely high risk for tetanus. So I think I babbled enough on that one. <laughs> Uh, that was great, Dr. Tarpoff. Appreciate that, and uh, um, I know lots of lots of questions continue to arise, particularly on the modified live uh, uh, vaccine side. So that was uh, great information to share there. Um, 
If there are other questions from uh, attendees, and, and we've had uh, a great set of uh, uh, participants online, you guys are stuck with us the whole time. Um, uh, be sure to, if you've got a question, um, you can post that uh, um, either in the uh, the question and answer. Uh, so there's a little Q and A um, a button at the I think at the bottom of your screen. Um, you can use that uh, and post a question, or um, you can stick it there in the the webinar chat, and we will uh, we will grab those as well. Um, as, as we come along. So um, if you've got uh, got questions there, go ahead and, and, and post them up. Um, I'm going to go uh, back to, uh, to to Dr. Wagner. And um, one of the things that, uh, uh, Justin, you talked about uh, a, a little bit in, in your talk was sort of um, uh, the adequacy of uh, um, forage availability uh, kind of here in the, in, in the drought conditions and making sure um, you know those those cows have uh, even though it may be greenish to brown um, just because it looks good doesn't necessarily mean there's enough out there um, do you kind of have some some rules of thumb on um, you know kind of how much standing forage and, and and how do you estimate that and what's a good strategy for producers to to kind of gauge if the cows have adequate feed yeah so one of the Kind of the guiding principles that I always kind of use is, you know, when you, it, the, and there's, there's a tremendous amount of regional variability, you know, as you look at, um, you know, eastern Kansas, you know, there's a possibility of using some, some visual uh, grazing sticks and those kind of things. As you get out to western Kansas, you can, uh, you can use those, there's some other tools you can use as well. But from a management perspective, one of the things that, that it's always kind of stuck with me that I heard a long time ago uh, was, you know, can a cow eat all she wants to each and every day? And if, if you look at a pasture and you begin to kind of ask yourself that question, or it certainly doesn't look like it, um, that's a scenario where, you know, we're, we're getting into that, that situation where we are limiting that, that cow's ability to, to, to go out there and, and consume forage. So... Um, that's, uh, and maybe that's, I, I guess, um, I'm not sure that I completely answered your question, but I think that's the, you know, one of just the guiding principles that I always kind of give to cattle managers is, is really think about what's out there in terms of forage resources. And I think the other thing that can be very helpful is, you know, kind of having a historical basis on whatever land unit that you're working with, you know, what does it, what does typical forage production look like? And then, you know, a third resource is, is to always kind of look at the local county agent, uh, as well as, you know, both the, the folks on the NRCS and, and pulling some of that data together to see what that forage production for that particular site would look like. Those tools like GrassCast as well can also be uh, very helpful as well in that, in looking and evaluating at that. So. Good yeah, question, I Dr. Weber. Yeah, I think yeah, two two things there. Once um, that historical perspective can be can be really valuable. Um, I like the um, suggestion. You know, go go figure out on a dry matter basis how much feed um, a, a critter has to consume per day. You know, when uh, fourteen hundred pound cows, you know, uh, twenty eight pounds of dry matter um, intake is uh, kind of on on target there, perhaps, and. Um, you know, start figuring out, you know, if you've got a hundred cows out there, how much feed do they have to consume every day? Um, the other one I, I always sort of fall back on a little bit, you know, just go watch your cows. Um, you know, if they're out grazing in the heat of the day um, and not shaded up somewhere, um, that could be a sign that and it's particularly hot, um, that you know, they can't get enough grazing done um, during the cool part of the day to get uh, get intake met. And that can be a, a one of those behavior behavioral cues um, that says they might be uh, be short on feed. So yeah, good, uh, good, good question there. Um, again, if you've got uh, got questions, um, uh, be sure and, and post those up uh, either in the Q&A or um, in the uh, in the chat box. I'll check both here. Um, I don't, don't see anything right off. So um, if you don't have any, uh, we'll kind of do a, a last call here. But uh, um, Maybe throw a, a, another Weber question at, uh, at Dr. Johnson. You know, Sandy, as you think about, um, you know, particularly your your preg diagnosis and and, and monitoring, um, what's your take on sort of? And I know a number of producers here in Eastern Kansas uh, have access to veterinarians that do have uh, ultrasound uh, tools to help diagnose and stage pregnancies. Um, you know, 
pros and cons of that versus, you know, kind of a, a skilled and traditional, um, just manual palpation um, of those cows and, and, and how sensitive are both of those to um, you know, the timing of a pregnancy diagnosis? Sure, Bob. Well, I, I think the great thing is that uh, as technology prices have come down, we have more and more veterinarians that have uh, included ultrasound as part of their practice. And so there's greater opportunities to get uh, that service. And, you know, if we look at, uh, to take, there was a study that looked at essentially accuracy of ultrasound, not knowing uh, what, what the breeding dates were. So they just went in and, and scanned and took a, uh, looked at an image of the first you know, essentially we could age those by taking measurements of the head or the crown rump length, several different things. So they essentially took the first one of those they could, and those were accurate um, to within 14 days of their actual calving date. So even with ultrasound, we still have some, um, you know, it's not a perfect estimation. You know, there's a lot of factors going into that. Um, and, the, and the other thing, uh, I have an opportunity to scan a number of groups that they're all, they're either 50 days pregnant or not at all. And you're amazed at the amount of variation and growth that you see in, in uh, those animals are all bred on the same day. So th there's variability. We're going to see it whether we're palpating or whether we're using ultrasound. You know, I certainly like the advantages of ultrasound in terms of uh, you're, you're seeing on a heartbeat, you know, you've got a viable embryo or fetus there. And it's, it's uh, going to be a little bit more accurate than uh, just trying to, to palpate other structures and estimate those by feel. Um, I don't know that I have a manuscript to back that up, but having done those things, you know, it's just, um, it's more challenging. So um, certainly the opportunity to use ultrasound on those early pregnants has a lot of advantage. And, you know, I don't want to, you know, a good thing to do is visit with your veterinarian about what, what uh, tools they have to bring to the table, where they're comfortable with palpation, and really what, what your goals are based on the time that you're doing your preg check. And I, I guess I was hoping to help people uh, understand that as you look at checking at different stages and, you know, the further out you are, the less precision you have, but that may or may not be as critical depending on, you know, what your total breeding season length is and, and what your goals are. Yeah, great. So kind of a, a little bit of a balancing act really to, to you know, um, sort of sort out what, what questions do you want to answer and then make sure the timing of the, the activity matches that um, requirement for precision of, of staging those pregnancies. So, yep, great, great right. advice. Yep, great. Well, um, I'm checking here for our, our Q&A and I don't, don't see any more. So um, we will uh, uh, sign off for now. Um, before we do that, uh, a, a couple of uh, uh, reminders here. Um, uh, certainly, uh, uh, the links for resources have been up for a while. Um, we'll uh, make sure those get um, uh, included in the, the recording for the session as well, uh, but encourage you to, to utilize those, uh, uh, their resources we find useful and hope uh, you do as well. Um, so they're, uh, they're posted there. Um, also, uh, as we move uh, ahead, um, there will be, a, I think, a survey um, window open on your screen as soon as uh, you leave the, uh, uh, the webinar, and uh, we'd appreciate your comments. Um, we're thick -hided, so um, tell us what you liked, what you didn't like about uh, today's webinar, and uh, maybe most importantly, um, uh, share some thoughts and ideas on uh, additional programming you might find useful. We always uh, um, ask for those uh, inputs and, and frequently find uh, uh, material or information needs uh, for our uh, uh, the producers we work with and, and appreciate that uh, input very, very much. So uh, do take a minute or two and, and share your thoughts there. We'll appreciate that. And uh, again, if there's uh, anything our team can do to uh, assist you in uh, 
um, resource assessment or decision making, um, please reach out to us. We're, uh, we're at your disposal and uh, look forward to those uh, interactions as we move ahead. And uh, we'll keep you all posted uh, as we get more uh, uh, webinars uh, scheduled in the future. Um, we'll be sure and alert you to uh, those upcoming opportunities. Uh, as always, uh, a wealth of materials available at uh, www.ksubeef.org. That's our uh, extension uh, website uh, for beef cattle stuff here at K-State. And uh, I encourage you to check that out and, uh, and, and see what resources are there that uh, you might be able to use. So with that, we'll sign off for today and uh, appreciate everybody joining. We look forward to talking to you soon.